Hello, hello. It's Jacob Hill with GRC Academy. Today, I'm here with Mr. Mark Nichols. Mark, how are you today? Hi, Jacob. I'm well. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much for coming on. And folks, if you're enjoying the podcast, please take a moment to like, comment, share, subscribe, review, all the things. Really helps me out. Thanks in advance. Mark, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your background and how you got to where you are today. Oh, thanks, Jacob. Well, it's probably a pretty long story, and a lot of it, I'm sure, is a bit boring to your listeners, so we won't uh, go into too much detail. But from late high school, I decided to get into computers back then. It was a lot of disciplines, mainly programming was the area that most people are interested in. And, and then uh, I pursued that, got into some programming, got into university, did some software development there, and then got into my first job. And yeah, I was an okay programmer. Not the best programmers and decided pretty quickly within the first year or two being in the real world that there's probably different ways within the IT sector that I can actually deliver value and probably better value than being a programmer because there's a lot better programmers around than I am. So I got moved into more consulting, working with clients, looking at how they can leverage technology and, uh, and then project management and that sort of broader picture around the technology and around the software rather right, than the software itself. Oh, that's fascinating. And I know back then, I mean, programming these days is a lot easier, I'm sure, than it was yeah. back in the day. <laughs> I started out with the old Cobol 68 and Cobol 74, as many of my colleagues uh, did also. There's lots of other languages along the way, but uh, they were pretty common in business um, back then. And still around today, right? Some of those languages still exist. Yeah. Yeah. They're still out there for sure. In today's day and age, we have all kinds of computer systems out there and security, cybersecurity, information security is obviously at the forefront. It's much more than it was 10 to 20 years ago. And so talk to us about why is security actually important? It's a really important topic, actually, Jacob, and really important to talk about security, particularly cybersecurity in the context of technology, because obviously a lot of the risks are around technology, a lot of the controls are around technology, but they're not exclusively technology. And in fact, a lot of the, the bigger picture view of the risk is actually business related. And so if you take a risk, a risk is really made up of two elements as the event, you know, what actually happens or could happen and what's the impact of that happening. That's the classical way of describing a risk. We're concerned because of this situation might occur and there's, we can put some likelihoods around that situation that this impact will be generated and we can put some levels around that impact. And through it, the likelihood and impact, we're going to assess the chances of happening and therefore how seriously we should be taking it and treating it. But of course, on the impact side, ultimately the only impacts that really matter for most businesses are business impacts. So yeah. most business people don't really care about like, in case a server goes down, right? Or in case maybe that website can't be accessed. Well, if that website's important or that website's important to the business, then yes, we should be concerned about it. But that's not always the case. And so cybersecurity and in fact security generally, therefore um, is very much a business issue or, or, or business consideration and should be. And that's a way of thinking about it is you look for the event side and whatever the event is should be a business event. And that way business people can actually take an interest in it and business people can actually participate and, and play their role. Just like over, over time, yeah, a lot of these disciplines haven't always been classic business disciplines. Technology itself, uh, it's very hard to be valuably contributing board member these days without being able to have some conversation around where digital technology fits. And increasingly the same is applying to cybersecurity. And if you go back far enough, then even having financial management skills wasn't common across every board member and every executive, senior executive. Nowadays, of course, knowledge and understanding varies, but nowadays it's very hard to participate in a lot of many of discussions unless you've got those skills. Those skills, which are seen to be being specialist skills in years gone by, they're increasingly just part of the toolkit that you need to have as an effective business leader. And mm -hmm. cybersecurity is now that, and it's becoming more that. And how does it become that? Well, the classic way in which it happens is through thinking about business events and the business aspect of risks is, is the easiest way. Yeah, I really like that perspective of talking about computers and the risk they actually bring into a business. Because 
I grew up with computers myself. I even think about the generations that are much younger than I and yeah. how ubiquitous it is and just how they don't think about it. It's just like an everyday thing for them. But yeah. truly, when we bring computers, especially connected computers, it just it adds risk to whatever aspect of the business it is. And it is something to consider because it, it's fascinating also to think about way back in the day, maybe not so far back, but when everybody was just using, they had lots of paper everywhere. And, and then here comes these computers. They're, they're efficient. They help you do things faster. And then the internet and then we're all connected. And now everybody has a phone. Everybody has a watch and everybody's connected to everyone at all at the same time. It's crazy. Right. But it's, it's interesting too. Uh, and I really like that thought about digital business risk. Mm -hmm. What risk does your computer systems actually introduce? Like, I just don't even think people yeah. think about it these days. Yeah. Well, some don't. The potential, but that's, that's part of the sort of gross journey, isn't it? And taking things for granted. Donald Rumsfeld, wasn't it? The made famous, the, the unknown unknowns statement. So that's there for a, a lot of people who work with computers, and particularly more on the user side, but happens as much on the uh, practitioner or professional side, is it's always unknown. And it's part of skilling. And one of the most important things you can do in your life I think, is education to minimize the number of unknown. And so at least you're aware of where you need help and the always blind spots, right? But and it doesn't stop them being there. And, and then cyber is in that category. There's certainly many people who don't really appreciate all the risks that they might have. And, and that's in their personal lives as well, right, Jacob? So things that they might do, like maybe installing TikTok on their phones, behaviors which to them people are not thinking about, introduces risk. Now, it could be tolerable and that's fine, but it could just be they haven't really considered it. That could be hell of stuff. And as you mentioned at the beginning, we're almost always in a business context, unless you're talking about critical infrastructure, they have different considerations. But if in a traditional business perspective, we're mostly talking about data, right? Talk to us about that and just the importance of securing data. We talked about risk before. We talked about business impacts. So there's really only a few major categories of these that uh, are material for most businesses. And yeah, you know, one of them is operational impacts. And because you mentioned critical infrastructure and mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's definitely a risk around Critical infrastructure not being able to operate, it has yeah, nation state sovereignty, well-being, yeah, lives which are impacted, but it doesn't have to be that, that sort of severe in terms of risk impact. It can just be an impact on that company. So if a company can't operate, then what does that mean? Because they've got some sort of outage, could be cyber event that's caused the outage. And so they can't operate. And maybe it means their production line shuts down. Maybe it means they can't invoice. Maybe it means they can't get supply in so they can't fulfill orders. There are all the types of things which you're know, lower in terms of impact and critical infrastructure. But for that company, it, it could be a terminal event. If they can't operate, then they can't invoice. If they can't invoice, they don't gain revenue. And that could be financially terminal for them. And that, so that's one type of business impact is that impact on operations. The, the other type, of course, is data related, which is they're holding data, which has some sort of private, more confidential nature to it. And that could be their own data. Most likely it's going to be data they're holding on behalf of others. And uh, it could include personal information. And, and so there can be reputational impact. There can be regulatory impacts and fines, potentially worse than that in terms of direct legislative action against the company or, um, or board or executive officers. So that's just the second category is data. And the third is kind of data related, but a little bit different. And that is intellectual property that you might be holding. And so that you want to protect because it's what gives you one of the advantages in your business that is highly valuable or gives you a more valuable proposition in the way you're deploying that into your business. And then each of these scenarios can have sort of secondary consequences. So it's not unusual to have contracts with say, particularly on the supplier side, potentially on the customer side. Where if you have some sort of breach, then suppliers and or customers can have contracts which allow them to exit those agreements on the basis of you being breached. Now, it's going to come a time when most companies or most organizations will get breached at some point. Right? It's, yeah, right. And so contracts are probably going to evolve the time as well because it basically gives an easy out clause for anybody. 
But yeah, that's a, it's a, a nature of the secondary impacts that any type of breach can have. But generally, the three main categories is that sort of personal data, intellectual property, or, uh, or some sort of uh, outage which prevents you operating. So in that context, I mean, if you look at the data one, then it's going to be important to know what that data is that you've got and what the potential impacts might be of, of that being either confidentiality being breached, um, integrity being impacted, or potential lack of availability, although that tends to be more of, a, more of an operations type impact. So once you know where it is and what it is, then you can start looking at ways to protect it. And again, this, this goes back to business is we talked about those sort of macro level but ideally, you want to be getting down to levels of detail where you can actually target your own controls and behaviors. And so that allows you to focus your investment more appropriately rather than setting the same standard everywhere and, and spending a, a high value to try and create high levels of protections on everything. Then you should have a, a reasonable protection on most things, but some things you may want to have much more protection on. It allows you to focus your investment accordingly. You're getting more detail. I'd love to get your perspective on how can we help the C suite or board members understand the importance of security and be willing to make the investment to go beyond checking the boxes. You know, the old saying compliance checkbox, the checkbox approach. How yep. can we help them to understand the, the real importance of this so that they'll be willing to make investments? It's a really important question. And and look, it's probably one that I'd say you've encountered, Jacob, and I have, and we all have in the tech industry for as long as we've been practicing in it, is this disconnect that can occur between technology people and business people. And there's no shortage of, of technology people over the years that uh, complain about business people not understanding. And you know, I've got memories or flashbacks to movies of somebody not being able to speak a particular language. So the person who's speaking this language, the other listener doesn't understand things. The remedy is to speak louder and quicker at them because surely that'll help them understand it. Of course, it doesn't. And the same in the tech world, it's, it's not about trying to force a particular view. It's more about, well, actually, we've got a, it's not the same language we're speaking here. We need to get to a common language. And ultimately, that common language is business implications. Yeah. What does it mean for business? That's a game we're all in. Yeah. Technology is a means to the end. It's not the end in itself. Yes, there needs to be technology-based discussions with technologists, but it comes to engaging business-level discussions on things like, what are we investing? Why do we invest in that versus something different? Why is this so urgent? They're business-based sort of dialogue. And, and if we want support for those types of agendas, then we need to talk business language. And those who are successful in technology typically do well in that. So those CIOs who get promoted and then become business leaders are very good at talking business language. And the same in the cyber space. So in cyber, those CISOs that do very well, gain lots of respect, are able to have very meaningful business discussions. And typically those business discussions are around business risk and business scenarios that might play out as an example to create that business risk. And then alongside that business risk will be financial discussions and investment discussions on how to mitigate or avoid business, those events which lead to those business risks. And how do we quantify what those risks might be and how much do we ha have to invest to actually mitigate them? And, mm -hmm. and what, how does that, what does that look like on the portfolio of things that we could do within this organization? Because there's always more you can do in cyber, right? There's, there's, there's always more you can invest in. There's always another tool set. There's always more capability, more controls. Yeah. Which ones do you do? Which ones don't you do? These are ultimately business decisions that should be determined on a business basis. And so that's where you can have that dialogue with those business people is learn to talk in their language, learn to talk in terms of what's the business implications of this risk scenario and what's the cost of the controls to actually yeah. mitigate that or at least mitigate that down to risk tolerance and how does that stack up in terms of yeah. value for money? How does that stack, stack up against the other opportunities well, we've got to spend money in this organization? And then being able to accept that not all decisions will go your way, right? So you might think, well, yeah. yeah, this is something I think is really important, but then you don't control all the dollars. Others have to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But as long as they've made those decisions with full mindfulness of, what's at stake here and what their 
biting off in terms of risk because no business can eradicate all risks, right? That's the nature of the game. And so if they're happy to accept that risk, that's fine. You should too. If the risk changes though, if threat landscape changes, then sure, re-prosecute that argument as appropriate, but to have that dialogue at the business level and, and respect the fact that there is decisions to be made, which can be outside of your control, but yeah. continue to do your professional job. And, and so really that's a way to, to engage, Jacob, as they get into that business discussion. And, and, and for those of your listeners who aren't used to having that, the only way to get used to it is actually by starting to do it and then practicing and then thinking that way and getting into more discussions and, and you'll get better at it. Well, speaking of that, let's have a little bit of fun. So I'll be the CEO and you can be my security guy. And the first round, I want you to do a terrible job, okay? <laughs> All right, I'm going to wipe the smile off. <laughs> Mr. Nichols, I really like the operating system that we're on. And you're telling me that we have to upgrade? That's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I like it. Everybody else likes it. Why do we need to do this? I'm a, I'm a very typical techie guy here. And I'm going to tell you that that old operating system, it just doesn't have the features that the new modern operating systems have. And the new features will let us do a lot more great things technology related things that we've been trying to do for a while and it'll allow us to install some new programming languages there's this particular piece of software we want to install <laughs> exactly <laughs> i was checking my watch i didn't have one <laughs> yeah the new features in the contemporary systems is a it's a very common line isn't it <laughs> hopefully i threw those in for your entertainment <laughs> excellent excellent all right, let's do it again. This time, do your best shot here. Yeah. Mr. Nichols, I like this operating system. Windows XP has been so good to me. I don't see any reason to get off of it. Why should we do that? Yeah, so the challenge we've got is that we're at an increased risk of ransomware. If we do get attacked by ransomware, it's going to be reputationally damaging for our organization. It could lead to some major outages, which will have some impact on those contracts we were just talking about yesterday. And how could ransomware affect us? Well, it'll basically lock down all our systems and stop us from operating and then be quite reputationally damaging and could take weeks, perhaps months to actually get our system back and our data back. And we'll have some difficult decisions about whether to pay ransomware. There could be regulatory impacts here as well. And so it's something we want to avoid as much as we can. Now, we do have ways of recovering and remedying in our systems, but it's not an instant fix. And as I said, it still could take weeks potentially months. So we want to avoid it, but those particular servers don't allow direct monitoring and control by the system that will be able to monitor for the existence of ransomware. By updating those systems, we can actually connect our same, our, um, it's a, a name of the system which actually detects ransomware, it can act instantly. Maybe what we need to do is if you're that concerned, we need to weigh up the respective business impacts of you upgrading your systems and maybe to some new versions versus the risk of a ransomware event across the entire organization and weigh up what that looks like in terms of cost benefit for each. But I think you're, what you'll find is that the upgrade of your system, so we actually detect ransomware will be a, a much better business case. Is that all, Mr. Nichols? No, I'm just kidding. That was great. Was that all right? That was great. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think what's critical for us security folks, and I'm coming at this as a director level, haven't been in the C-suite yet, but even just what I've learned and to back up exactly what you said is that we are a player. Maybe we're a key player, but we are just one of the players in the business. Oftentimes, we're not the decision maker. So we have to explain these things using terminology that they understand and that makes sense to them. And that's exactly right. It's most organizations do have some form of federated decision making. It's very rare where it's, it's a, a single individual who can make a decision. And even if they do, it doesn't mean that they get some blowback if there's impacts across the organization with some negative consequences. So the best way of managing those is managing them proactively, right? Having that conversation up front and, and having the outcome being, or, or that it, those individuals being part of the outcome and part of the decision, not having something done to them. It's, it's the old change management adage, isn't it? Yeah, making the change with the, those stakeholders, not making the change to those stakeholders. And yeah. uh, being able to communicate is part of that challenge. Well, share any interesting war stories with us, because no doubt you've had many in your career and just some really interesting events that, uh, that you think would be interesting to talk about from a security perspective. 
Oh, yeah, it's always always challenging, isn't it? Because most most things that you're aware of, you always know that there's going to be other people who know exactly that story. And it, it can have people feeling pretty uncomfortable. I would say probably more so in Australia, Eva Jager, because it's a much smaller world than it is in the US. And you can probably hide a lot easier in the US. But there's lots of stories uh, over the years. If I go back far enough, I, I will tell one story about, it's a really Simon, but it, it plays a similar role in the, Except to what I referred to earlier is executives and board members being on this learning journey continuously. And so now one of the most topical things is around cyber, of course, AI is quite emergent. And then previously technology generally. And then even previous to that, I might have mentioned, I think, about the financial expertise and how that wasn't always common. And, and I did have a conversation, we're going back more than a couple of decades, with a particular executive. And I was doing exactly what I was just saying earlier. We had a decision coming up on a business case and we had to get a steering committee approval prior to the investment approval occurring. And so uh, on behalf of the sponsor, I was talking to all the other steering committee members offline in individual meetings about this particular business case. It was an easy one to approve. It was a couple of million bucks investment. It was an add on to an existing large program, which was in flight. It was already up and running very efficiently. So the capability was there to just plug this extra piece on and um, build on what was needed to be done. A couple of million investment, which actually returned that investment within about 14, 15 months. And that was a payback wow. period. And so the return on investment value was very strong, but it still needed to go through the approval process. And, and I was having this conversation with one particular steering committee member. All he kept talking about was how much this organization had to save money. Initially, I was like, yes, of course. And this will save a lot of money. Obviously, it takes a little bit of capital up front. And after a year, it's all return on investment. And you get a couple of million a year coming back. And so it was a bit of a no-brainer, but he kept on reinforcing about how short-term we've got to save money. And it wasn't until maybe 15 minutes into this conversation that I realized he hasn't really understood the difference here between a capital investment and an expense. I didn't realize that at the time. And it's one of the big challenges in our industry, I think, when it comes to communication is really understanding the knowledge of the individual so you can communicate at that right level. And, and of course, this individual I was sort of banging on about return on investment. And uh, for him, it's like, well, in his first year, we've got to save money. Of course, this organization had plenty of capital, but their profitability was being threatened. And this was therefore a yeah, perfect project. But from his point of view, it was like, no, no, we've got to spend more money. We've got more cash going out than we've got cash coming in in the first year. And so therefore it's not a good project. But from an accrual accounting perspective, it was capital that we were spending in the first year, positive cash flow after that. And so the last thing I could do at that point was to confront that issue. Yeah, that would have just created an embarrassing situation for him and not great for me. So I just finished off what I had to say and yeah, encouraged him to do his research and reflection. And he could come back to me with, with any questions if he needed to. And, and then proceed to brief anybody else. And I briefed the sponsors are about potential lack of understanding of this area. Anyway, it all went through fine. And that was all approved and he supported it in the end. And I don't know exactly what his journey was to get to that point. I don't know if he just had a sort of a poor day thinking about that problem on the day I talked to him for all I don't. Yeah, but it's an example of little study challenges that you can come across and that can happen in the cyber world quite a bit as well. The things that you assume in terms of knowledge, it should be effectively a no-brainer, aren't mm -hmm. quite that way because everybody's thinking yeah. patterns aren't exactly the same and assume knowledge isn't always there. And so therefore, you've always got to be alert and aware of those scenarios. Yeah, that's so true. And I think they call that active listening. And I, that, that's a great story. And one of the bo best bosses I ever had early on in my career, he told me it sounds so simple and it is. Well, it, it can be complicated <laughs> yeah. depending on, because you got the human element, right? Yeah. But it's simply tailor your presentation or your communication to your audience. Yeah. Know in exactly what you said, you almost have to, you, have an idea of what they know and understand yeah. so that you can help them really get to the, the next point that we need to steer them to. Sometimes it's just one small step getting, getting to the point where you can get a champion on your side. Sometimes I found that 
somebody else just needs to say the same thing you're saying. And that really can help a lot to have someone, to have an advocate saying the same thing you are. That's right. Yeah. I sometimes refer to um, what it takes to be a leader or to, to have a leader. And it is exactly what you just said. Like you were trying to create a leadership position there, but until you had a follower, you weren't truly a leader. And then you got to follow us and then reinforce your role and, and help people take attention, right? Pay attention to you. So yeah, that was a, that was a good step forward by that individual that I have a little bit of courage there to, to jump on the same thing you're saying that, and actually create a leadership role for you. And, and they became leaders also as a result. What advice would you have for folks who are starting in cybersecurity, information security? What would you tell them to maybe focus on or some particular skills or just even a particular attributes to really work at? Yeah, it, it's, it's always challenging these types of questions and I can understand where individuals find it challenging because it's such a broad area, right? And you might want to be super tech going into lots of deep technical specialized domains and that's fine. Or you could be more, you know, looking at um, how do you engage with business and uh, from a, you know, the types of uh, topics we've been talking about today, business risk and there's whole combinations in between. So I think most, most people will have a gut feel about where in that sort of spectrum of styles they're going to fit. And then I think it's just about getting started. You know, I sometimes think that particularly younger people when they're sort of coming out of uh, high school and, and university, you get very sort of hung up on what's the design of my life going to be and what are all the pathways that I'm going to be following for the next 10 years. And, and increasingly people change careers and they do that because they learn as they go. And they understand themselves and learn a lot about themselves as much about the opportunities that are out there. So yeah, that's one of my, one of the, my pieces of advice is, yeah, just take those first few steps. Don't, don't feel the need to kind of chart the entire path. And uh, you're probably actually a good gut feel about where you feel most comfortable, where you feel most valuable, those areas that you enjoy most. And so take steps in that direction. And once you get into that, into that new space, then other opportunities will open up and you'll get to see the next steps in your path without having to be too design orientated around the entire journey. So that I think helps a lot for um, people at the start of their journey and, and not feeling as if they need to have the perfect sort of roadmap all lined out for their life. It doesn't always happen that way, does it, Jacob? It does not. My career has <laughs> been like that. <laughs> Twists and turns. But it's been good. I think most people are like that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where can people find you? Mark V. Nichols. I think for most most places, if you Google that, you'll find a way of chasing it through to my LinkedIn. Easy to find me there. Or go to informpros.com or informpros.com.au. Either one will work. And so I'll be on the website there. A lot of people want to track me down. I look forward to it. I reach out and uh, let me know you've been uh, listening to Jacob's podcast. And yet, yeah, I'll be happy to have a chat with you. Well, Mark, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jacob. It's my pleasure.